Hello, everyone. Welcome to McGill Cares, a weekly webcast series addressing a wide variety of topics to support family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver who became a certified dementia care consultant and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Fried, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. I would like to thank the Lindsay Memorial Foundation for sponsoring today's webcast. Today, the topic is living with and supporting a loved one with ALS. My guests are Dr. Angela Genge, Director of the Clinical Research Unit at the Montreal Neurological Institute. She is a neuromuscular neurologist and leads the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis clinical program and multidisciplinary clinic. Dr. Genge has received numerous awards, most recently the 2018 Forbes Norris Award, the Diva of Distinction Award, and the Governor General Diamond Jubilee Award. I also have Ms. Lee Stevens, a social worker and psychosocial counselor at the ALS Society of Quebec. She supports people living with ALS and their caregivers at every stage of the disease, from diagnosis through end of life and bereavement. Her work developing programs and services for caregivers led her to her involvement in the consultation process for the development of the National Policy for Caregivers in Quebec. Welcome to our webcast. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to be having two perspectives. We're going to be discussing the medical aspects of ALS and really understanding what the disease is. And then we're going to talk about the importance of support services for individuals. So I'm going to begin with Dr. Gange, who I'm, I, you know, I've known people throughout my lifetime who've had ALS, but I really don't understand the whole evolution of the disease. So maybe you can talk to us about the disease and what the early symptoms and risk factors are. So ALS is one of those diseases in which the initial symptoms feel very benign, very um, unimpressive for the individual developing the symptoms. Uh, so it's very hard to connect the symptoms with how serious the disease can be. So a few people that have been very prominent in Quebec and have told their stories over the years have actually expressed it quite well. Tony Proudfoot mm -hmm. started with a slurred speech and was accused of having uh, been uh, drinking on air, which led him to uh, see me. And we diagnosed his ALS very early. Slurred speech or difficulty swallowing can often be the first sign. Um, and we call this bulbar onset. Uh, other people who have been in the news, Nancy Rock, um, Helen Peltier, have talked about their symptoms as well. It can start with a weakness in the leg. Um, one of the ladies had a change in her ability to run. She was a runner. My Another common uh, presentation has been in a uh, change in the ability to play golf because your stance changes because of a weakness or stiffness in your leg. Finally, a, a, a problem with the hand can present as a misdiagnosed carpal tunnel syndrome, where you have trouble holding something, you're dropping things in the kitchen, or as one of my equestrian patients once told me, she was started to have difficulty holding the reins of her horse. So these are very benign symptoms. They're not, people see it, feel them and they kind of ignore them. And only as the evident weakness or stiffness progresses, do they seek medical attention and then are diagnosed with ALS. ALS is one of those diseases that is more common than we realize. What we express is an incident of uh, two to five per 100,000 people, but your risk of developing ALS over your lifetime is one in 400 based on Canadian statistics. The most common age group is the ones that you hear about in the news. Um, usually people between 45 and 65, slightly more common in men than women, typically very active, healthy people with absolutely no medical problems, which is 
in part why sometimes it really is the patient themselves who ignores the symptoms because they can't imagine they have serious. But it's a series of pancreatic cancer. The life, the, um, life expectancy with diagnosis is very similar to something like pancreatic cancer, and we should really react to it in this way. So from diagnosis to end of life is often two to five years, although we're making some inroads. But as you can see, two years is not that long. The most famous recent politician was the uh, Muriel Belanger, who was a Franco-Ontarian member of parliament for many years. And when Trudeau was first elected, he was running as speaker of the house for the federal government when colleagues noticed that his speech was slurred. He had to withdraw and he died within a year of that first recognized dysarthria. He was amazing, but it was quite a shock to us. What are the risk factors? I mean, is it is it caused by, you know, brain injury? I mean, you know, uh, concussions? You know, I, I mentioned before yeah. we went on air that I had heard a whole talk about concussions. I mean, how? what are the risk factors? So it's a great question. One risk factor is genetic. Um, probably between 10 and 20 percent we now recognize as, as uh, caused by genetic mutations, but a lot of those people don't have a family history we, uh, of the disease. We've, we've discovered a couple of genes that are actually without a family history that are new in the patient. And then we have to look for um, the uh, mutations, the genetic uh, mutations in other family members, but you can be the first person in your family to have the genetic mutation. So that's one group. There are other groups, however. We believe that there is some association with head injury and neck injury. There has been an association with certain occupations, but what is striking is the lack of association with some of the common diseases. There's no association with diabetes, hypertension, smoking, a lot of the risk factors we think of for, for bad disease, so to speak don't exist in ALS. The risk factor of inactivity is actually the opposite. Most patients who develop ALS are quite physically active, either by their profession or um, by their hobbies. Uh, professional athletes get it. What is most interesting, and we still don't fully understand it, is that there is a separation of which athletes get the disease and so it's explain, big, yeah so what do you mean by is there certain sports of that yeah yeah it's really interesting um so and it it refers a bit to your concussion question and also may somehow be connected with with pesticides or, or something in the environment certain environments but we know that it is more common in American football and European football, and very uncommon in basketball, say, and in cycling, professional cycling. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a number of baseball players like Lou Gehrig, which, to, for which the disease is named. A number of golfers uh, have developed it in the professional ranks. So it's not the level of fitness, and it may not even be the type of activity. There's something else that, that causes it to be increased in these uh, particular sports. There's also been good reports that there was an increased risk in the American military. And so the American Department of Defense is very engaged in some of the research. Um, but the uh, first Gulf War had a, a marked increase in veterans from that war who developed ALS. So there are a number of risk factors do we know for sure? No. Um, but we see associations that we look at. And then there are certain things that we do once the patient is, once somebody is diagnosed, to try to mitigate or slow down the disease that are involved lifestyle changes in particular. Yeah. So take us through the journey of the disease. Like, 
how does it evolve? Like from the, the beginning, you mentioned a few early symptoms, but what is it? What does it look like through the span of two to five years? So uh, let's uh, start with someone uh, whose weakness is in their leg. So typically, if it starts in one leg, it will either move to involve the other leg. So they'll begin having difficulty walking, running, exercising, then we'll start to need a cane or a walker, and ultimately we'll end up in a wheelchair, uh, usually first a, a regular wheelchair and then eventually an electric wheelchair. It can also spread directly from a leg to the arm on the same side. So you uh, start to have difficulty doing your normal activities of self-care and your normal activities of daily living. Um, ultimately, patients will, if it starts in, in a, a leg, uh, will end up fully dependent, um, but still able to communicate and still able to breathe, um, needing help feeding. Conversely, if it starts in, with your speech and your swallowing, you may have exactly the opposite um, disease course where you're unable to communicate and having difficulty eating, requiring some sort of a feeding tube, yet still able to walk, to do your own activities of daily living, to get out, do your own shopping, all these kinds of things. So it's not that it has one particular presentation, but the presentations it does have are all related to muscle function. Mm -hmm. So a muscle stops functioning normally. And then the muscle next to it starts stops functioning normally. And the progression is really based on the weakness or stiffness that's related to the loss of muscle function. So although the disease itself, when we look at the science behind it, has some very clear patterns of loss of particular nerves, what people feel is a loss of function. Is there any correlation between ALS and cognitive decline? I mean, have you seen in any patients? So know, there's, a there of... is a particular type of dementia that is actually associated with ALS. And somewhere between 20 and 50% of people have it. Uh, it's not like Alzheimer's, Claire. It's actually called frontotemporal dementia. Yeah. And the issue is more a personality change, mm -hmm. trouble making decisions, which makes the care of an ALS patient with this very complex. Mm -hmm. um, they start to laugh and cry spontaneously and inappropriately, but it's a change in their personality and their ability to make decisions that makes their care so complex. And obviously, as I describe it, their care is quite physical. So it's very different than the Alzheimer's patients who's out wandering around, but physically mm -hmm. intact. It's the opposite kind of care. It's really physical care that they need. So before we talk about that care, which I can only imagine, uh, you know, how, how challenging it must be for family members, what treatments are available, like pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical, if any? So there, no, there's always, there are some, and there's a lot coming. Um, so if I say anything to new patients, there's tremendous hope. Mm -hmm. There are two drugs that are approved. Uh, both extend life um, and should be started early. And both extend life based on what we now understand for anywhere from three months, which is very short, to two years, which is actually can make the difference between getting to someone's wedding or birth mm -hmm. or graduation. Um, those two drugs are Ruliazol and Radicava, and there, there are a dozen right behind these two drugs. The other thing that makes a huge difference is being followed in a multidisciplinary clinic like ours at the Neuro. And the research has shown that life can be extended by two years just by being followed at a clinic where they can prevent complications, where we can predict what you need next. Um, two years just from going to clinic, to the right kind of clinic. Could you explain for those people watching the term multidisciplinary and who are the professionals involved in the care? So for if you come to our clinic, and our clinic has 
speaks what five or six languages amongst the staff. So we start off by being able to communicate. The key players, so to speak, are the nurse, the occupational therapist, the physiotherapist, the speech therapist, the nutritionist, the ortho orthopedist, um, guy who makes the equipment, the um, spiritual care advisor, uh, the respiratory therapist. I'm going around my room yeah, 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 yeah. because our clinic is set up so you come and you see everyone on the same visit. Um, rather than coming 10 times, you come once and see everyone. So you stay for two, three hours, but you get all the work done at the same time. We also have an ALS a Quebec representative that in normal times is part of our clinic. And so they also get information about what the society provides. We also include a clinical trial coordinator in our clinic because we run uh, many trials looking at new drugs. We run it like an oncology program. And uh, we have, we really have patients look at opportunities for, for extending life, getting a response, doing better on some of these new drugs that are in development. We work very hard to get people to keep weight on. We know that the one thing the patient completely controls is their weight. And if you can maintain your weight, you can extend your life by a year and a half hmm. with hmm. ALS. No other fa single factor has as big an impact on your quality of life and, and your, um, your ability to continue to do things and maintaining your weight, which is pretty mm -hmm. funny because yeah. people come in on crazy diets and I say, eat, eat huh. a great Mediterranean diet, eat everything yeah. you're not allowed to eat, eat. So I sound very old fashioned when I get started, but there are some real breakthroughs for the genetic forms of the disease. We are have, there's one program where I've seen patients for the first time ever stop progressing. Hmm. People who should not be with us are still with us and haven't changed in four years. So there are really big breakthroughs coming for small groups of people. So it's really important to be followed by the right clinic and to be followed by a clinic that provides this care. So Lee, now we're gonna to talk to you about the importance of support services. So what are the most important things that a person receiving a diagnosis, I mean, also Dr. Gaines, you can jump in, but needs to know in order to plan for their future. And like, what are the things the family member needs to know? How, are, how do we support the person and the family? Um, well, so, People living with ALS and their caregivers reach out to the society uh, with a variety of needs, even at the very beginning. So our approach is a very personalized one. Uh, so we meet each person where they're at. Um, but some of the common things that we talk about with families include uh, the shock of the diagnosis and the ensuing emotions that result from that, um, information about the disease and its progression. Uh, a huge one is navigating the healthcare system and especially getting in touch with the CLSC right away is a a crucial step, I would say, even if you don't need any care right away, but just to have the number on hand of the person you need um, when, if and when the time comes. Uh, we talk about um, looking at insurance policies and government programs and tax uh, benefits that people might be able to make use of. Um, it's important to have that information early. Um, we, with caregivers, we tell them to, uh, we encourage them to accept health early and often. Um, we, get, uh, we suggest family meetings where people can uh, concretely suggest how they can help the primary caregiver so that when the caregiver needs help, they have a list of uh, people they can contact for a variety of different things, whether it be a, a meal in the freezer or a lift to an appointment or something like that. Um, we also explain the society's uh, programs and services, of course. And then as things progress, um, and some of these things are relevant from the beginning, but uh, also, as things progress, you know, how to access um, adaptive equipment, you know, what do we do about the driver's license, do we stay at home, or how do we look at placement options, where can we access respite, uh, what does end of care look like, and how does medical aid and dying work, and even the legal aspects, you know, of a will, protection mandates, power of attorney, and advanced medical directives. Um, it's just a list of a few things. Uh, yeah. 
And, and do you have like educational videos? Because, you know, Dr. Genge, you mentioned that as a disease progresses, it really, it becomes very physical, you know, and, you know, as I think most family members, our primary profession has not been to be a nurse, right? So is there, do you have educational like videos or material to teach people how to, you know, do that, the work that in most cases, I guess the nurse would need to do? So uh, one important thing is to refer to the occupational therapist because they can guide you based on the health of and abilities of the person with ALS, but also the caregiver's abilities and any health concerns as well, and also mm -hmm. adapt any uh, techniques to the environment. Mm -hmm. um, that said, though, we do have uh, we do offer um, trainings and uh, conferences on a regular basis, and we have a section of our websites called the Taking Care Platform, where mm -hmm. you can access the information you need on demand in the format that you're looking for. So whether it's something to read, something to listen to, like a podcast, a, a video to watch, uh, those kinds of things. And, you know, okay, so let's talk about now the impact of COVID. And, you know, I'm assuming that most families will need to have, or will have, you know, will depend on the assistance. Because as you said, you, you have to get hold of the CLSC early and, you know, they're dependent on some type of support. What impact has COVID had on families right now? Um, it's interesting because at the beginning of the pandemic, we did a, a, a sort of a teleconference check in with our members to see how things were going. And a lot of people sort of said, you know, it's kind of like an extended winter to us. We tend to isolate anyway. Um, but one of the things that's important for caregivers is that, I think, and Dr. Genge alluded to this earlier, but um, the uh, um, Um, sorry, the, uh, the stress that's, that comes on in trying to um, determine whether or not to invite someone into your home and potentially put your loved mm -hmm. one at risk. I think mm -hmm. that's the biggest concern. And also with the healthcare professional sometimes uh, shifting in and out. So the people who maybe were used to dealing with or working with families with ALS may have shifted elsewhere. And so you may have mm -hmm. fresher uh, healthcare professionals who aren't as knowledgeable about the illness. Mm -hmm. That's another challenge. Mm -hmm. so what we again, declare yeah. is um, a couple of things. We initially, um, we were open. We have been open the entire time. We never closed our doors. We found a few th really important issues. Uh, one was people being afraid to come. Uh, and so there are people that we have really only talked to via telemedicine. Um, even since March, because they're afraid to come outside their homes. Um, we try to gently encourage people to get back to clinic, uh, particularly in the summer and fall, uh, so that we could see what was going on that couldn't be really communicated properly, pick up on things that had changed that they were not expressing to us. That was one issue and is still ongoing. And sometimes a fearful person is not the patient. Sometimes it's their mode of transport. It's their son or daughter. Um, second thing that was very clear to us um, is a number of people arrived on our doorstep because the other places they had been referred to were not open. They were not seeing people in person and so, and they were not able to get their tests done. So, so they were looking around and a few very resourceful partners found us and we were able to help them. Some of them were, at least one was from Ontario, at least one was mm -hmm. from New Brunswick and a few from, from Quebec. The, the third thing that we've seen is a significant delay in diagnosis because one of the major uh, tests that, are, that is used to confirm the diagnosis of ALS is something called EMG or electromyography. And all of those clinics were closed. So um, until we reopened, we were able to reopen very early at an outside clinic or EMG lab. And we, we had an onslaught of patients who had been delayed in their diagnosis because all the clinics were closed. You can't do this test virtually, it's a physical test. Um, and now the, the current most pressing issue is that resources that were continuing are now starting to disappear. We have a, a serious nursing shortage. 
in the province now. Um, and in some ways it's worse than it was in March and April. Um, and so nurses that could be available through an agency are they're, they're being called into the hospitals. A lot of nurses are in quarantine or out sick. So there's a lot of things that um, ALS patients need that are not available right now that they're having to make do. The other thing that we saw, and, and now I'm very careful uh, to be very clear with, with families is people were trying to protect their loved ones by not visiting them and were showing up to see them and finding really sad situations where mm -hmm. disease had become very apparent that was missed before March. People saw them in June, the patient had progressed, they clearly had ALS and they weren't doing well. We uh, had a few other instances, not necessarily ALS. I had a, someone in this situation who ended up having a primary brain tumor, but the kids were protecting them by not visiting them because they were elderly. And so in this wave, uh, and this shutdown, I strongly encourage people to make sure that someone is laying eyes on um, the older population and the people who live alone because they're not doing as well as, as uh, people may think on their own. We've certainly, and I can't express that enough. It's, yeah. it's the biggest concern I have about lockdowns is this reaction either on the family or the patient to be so fearful that they're actually not getting the care they need. We have to find a, a pragmatic way to deal with this. Well, I'm seeing the same thing. I mean, working with families with dementia, where it's a person who's living alone and the son or daughter often lives out of town, where we're really encouraging even neighbors to please neighbors check on a neighbor. If yeah. you have a neighbor who who has a condition like ALS or dementia, please check in on your neighbor because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the same thing. Um, Dr. Gensch, how do people have access to your clinic? Do they need to have a referral or how do they have access to you? So if they need a referral, but that referral can be from anywhere. And what, they just have to call okay. and we will help them get that referral. It is so simple. Uh, to get a referral. Um, it can be, uh, we've had referrals from physios, OTs, family members. It, for us, the priority is getting the patient in and, and into the system, getting the diagnosis, getting the corrections made in their lives, getting them started on the medications. So as long as they can call our clinic, we're great. And we will just work with them for everything else. Yeah. And, and Lee, um, with regards to the ALS Society right now, are you supporting families virtually? Like, how are you, how are you working with families? Yeah, uh, so since the beginning of the pandemic, we haven't stopped. Right? The staff is 100% remote and we're offering services remotely. Um, is it okay if I explain a little bit about what we do offer? Absolutely. Please okay. do. Uh, so as I mentioned, we offer a personalized support by phone, by email, by Zoom, sort of whatever is possible. Uh, you know, uh, most convenient for families. And uh, we even adjust our hours to, to uh, accommodate any scheduling conflicts. Um, and the purpose of the counseling team is essentially to allow people to vent and chat about what's going on, uh, to answer their questions, to provide resources. Um, we've got support groups as well for people living with ALS, for caregivers, for families who've had a recent diagnosis, and also for the bereaved, which is another uh, group that's been very impacted by the pandemic with not being able to do the normal things you would do when you lose somebody. Um, so we're seeing the needs increase quite a bit there. I mentioned about the conferences and training. Uh, we also have a guide that we send uh, to new families with a diagnosis that's accessible also on our website that uh, addresses all of the possible symptoms and uh, technical aids and equipment and uh, treatment that is available. Um, and um, I, by the way, I'm going to have, I already have the link to the ALS Society on the McGill Dementia Education Program website. And I would also like to put the link to your clinic, Dr. Genge, on our website so that people Absolutely. can get uh, uh, information, which is really important. My last uh, maybe question or statement refers to the importance of education, because I'm an advocate for education. I believe that in order to, you know, provide the best quality of care and take care of ourselves, we really need to understand the disease and how it progresses and how to care for ourselves. So 
if you could both talk to me about your what you believe the role of education can play. So I'm we'll going to I'm going to start. Um, it is more than critical, and in this time of random internet websites, all sorts of uh, misguided or commercial endeavors that can mislead families um, and patients tremendously, uh, dangerous endeavors. I would say some of these things for ALS are actually quite dangerous. Uh, it is extremely important that families get the education. They go on the, on the websites and they look up legitimate websites. They get their information from legitimate sources. So for ALS, that means ALS Society of Quebec, ALS Society of Canada, World Federation of Neurology, ALS group. Um, there are American and European groups. We uh, at the Neuro have a very um, strong and leading presence in clinical trials and clinical research. There are sites for support of all sorts of different things. You just have to be very careful you don't get misled. And that's why I strongly uh, recommend that people go to our website, go to ALS Quebec, ALS Canada, and, and really get educated in a proper way, Care Claire. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the most dangerous thing a family can do is go on to these, these um these sites that are really businesses and they're very misleading. They're snake oil salesmen in the modern era. And I just really encourage people to go to legitimate sources. And there are a number and they exist in multiple languages. You can be English, French, Italian, German, uh, Japanese. You can find information in your own language. Just avoid the snake oil salesman. Thank you very much for that very important message. And Lee, what about you? Well, as a planner myself, I would agree knowledge is power for sure. Um, and while ALS is, tends to be prioritized in the CLAC system, and uh, for example, on the rehab centers, and um, there can still be wait time. So the more that you can prepare, the better. Um, at the same time, what, what I, we seem to notice in uh, our families is that there seem to be two types of people, those who, for whom uh, knowing all of the possible uh, outcomes and situations uh, al allows them to feel better prepared and reduce anxiety. And then there's other people for whom, you know, um, moderation is better and uh, it, too much information can be overwhelming. So I would just say to, to strike a balance, you don't need to be an expert of, in everything in week one, but if you can look a few steps ahead, that would definitely be helpful. Thank you for your message. And thank you both for being on our webcast today. It's gone by so quickly. Like I greatly appreciate you taking the time and for the invaluable information that you both provided. And I, like I mentioned before, I'm gonna make sure to have a link to both your clinic and ALS Society on our website. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> we will be taking a holiday break um, until Wednesday, January 13th. And then we will be returning on that day with a very uh, important topic, which is living with and caring for a person who suffers from depression. My guest will be Dr. Gustavo Turecki, professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University, scientific director at the Douglas Institute Research Center, and psychiatrist in chief at the Montreal West Island CS. This webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. Once again, I would like to thank the Lindsay Memorial Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you have specific topics or questions that you would like us to address, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. I would wishing all of you a very healthy holiday. Please listen to the government sanitary measures. Please stay safe. And I look forward to seeing everybody again back in January of 2021. Thank you.